just ah, uh, hold on. Let's do. Okay, sweet. Forgot to mute my phone. We're good. Oh, you're good. All right, guys. I've got an amazing guest here. We've got Whitney. Is it Trammel or Trammel? Trammel. Like Tram- Trammel. Well, I totally butchered that anyway. Okay, so <laughs> totally Whitney fine. Trammel. We've got Whitney Trammel here. And Whitney, I actually just ran into Whitney at the San Antonio Total Archery Challenge at the PSE booth. And uh, we were just chatting a little bit about archery. She was talking with Cade over there. And um, and we just I just started seeing her stuff with the Bow Disciples, which is another fun group of people that it, it just looks like a blast that you guys have so much fun oh, shooting so much archery fun. and putting out good information on archery. And then I just found out you're into strength, conditioning, fitness. You're wearing a sore neck shirt. So this is going to be a great conversation. But more than anything, I wanted to bring someone on that uh, is involved in great causes wants people to enjoy archery, wants people to, to live a happier, healthier, more successful life, which is what I talk about. And uh, maybe people don't know you. So I love bringing people on like that as well that are just normal people like me and uh, just enjoy archery and fitness. So in a nutshell, Whitney, who are you? Yeah, I'm going to speak on kind of what you just said when you met me. I know when I first met you at TAC, the first thing was you were like kind of introducing myself and I was like, I'm a nobody, I'm irrelevant. And you're like, well, you're here, so you're somebody. And that kind of goes a long way whenever you're like meeting new people. So that was cool to hear. And thanks for that. Um, but as far as who I am, um, I was kind of telling you earlier, my background is as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, and then I've worked mostly with tactical populations, so police, military, and fire, but mostly with military. Um, and then most recently, I've worked more on the educational side of things to educate service members on kind of all aspects of human performance. So physical fitness, social fitness, nutritional fitness, mental fitness, um, and then spiritual fitness as well. Um, And then kind of my background in training and performance really led to really led me to the outdoors. I kind of saw the value in not even just training for the outdoors, but training in the outdoors. Uh, And I always like as a kid, I loved being outside and we can get into more of that later, but grew up outside grew up fishing, all that kind of stuff. And so I was like, man, I can really translate what I'm doing in the gym. And like, I don't always love being inside. So how can I do more things outside? Um, And that was kind of really what led me to being more outdoors and kind of led me to that space. That's awesome. That's awesome. And yeah, you know, honestly, to start off with, I, when people shake my hand and you didn't really recognize me to, to begin with either. We kind of chatted afterwards and you're like, Oh, I've been uh-huh. listening to podcasts, but I honestly, when people are like, Oh, I'm not really anybody. I'm like, no, that's not true. Everyone has something to share. Some for people sure, are right. just better at marketing it than others, but that's a big deal for me is I really genuinely feel that each and every individual is put here for a reason, um, on this earth, you know, and everyone has special Absolutely. talents and skills and whether you choose to cultivate them or not, it's up to you. Uh, but you could be doing a lot of disservice to people if you're if you're not cultivating it and at least sharing it with your immediate family your friends your your crew that you go shoot with whatever you don't have to be a social media guru to to make an impact on the world um and so that's why for me i there's a phrase it's like the graveyard is the most rich place on earth or something like that because of Mm -hmm. all the ideas Mm -hmm. that go to the grave with people because they're like Mm -hmm. oh i'm a nobody no one's gonna listen to me and Mm -hmm. so that's Mm -hmm. why i try and stress that you know, whenever I meet people and and they say things like that, I'm like, that's not true. I don't know who you are, but you've got something to give. Right. And so, and the fact that you're willing to go hike around and go, and again, I didn't know you were with the bow disciples or anyone else there, um, but you're willing to hike around and go shoot 3d targets in the Texas heat means something. (laughs) Right. And so (laughs) you you like archery enough. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, and then on top of that, you know, finding out that you really enjoy the fitness aspect and spiritual aspect. And you're, you're making those impacts in those different communities through your education that you're providing to others. And you've put time in and dedicated time into learning uh, these things so that you can become a master or, or better at it, more proficient at these, sure. these things in your life as well. So what, I guess, what drew you to the physical fitness world, strength and conditioning? Because I, mm-hmm. I personally was looking at going into uh, the CSCS program and mm-hmm. uh, and getting certified as a strength and conditioning coach. Chose not to go that route, but at one point I wanted to be a PT with a CSCS certification. And so kind of talk to us a, a little bit about that. What got you going down that path? And, mm-hmm. and I mean, that takes time, dedication, knowledge, and then application as well. So a lot of work. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, so thanks for asking. I um, I actually started out in undergrad as a pre-law political science major, so quite the difference <laughs> field there. I um, wanted to go to law school and I wanted to do criminal law, which people laugh at me because you don't get paid in criminal law, but it just sounded like it was fun. Uh, but I just really was not fond of the classes that I was taking. Like, not that I was doing poorly in them, it just wasn't interesting. So I had played sports all my life. Uh, volleyball was my main sport and then played soccer, ran track, cross country, like kind of did it all. I wasn't great at any of, or I wasn't great at all of them. I was, I was decent at volleyball. Um, so when I was deciding like what I wanted to switch to, I was always like a science nerd, like a math science brained person. And I liked sports. So kinesiology, exercise science was just kind of what made sense. Um, so switched to that and thought I wanted to do physical therapy. Um, interned in a couple PT clinics and it was just like too slow paced of an environment for me. So I sit down and I talk with one of my advisors in my undergrad um, and he was like, hey, I think strength and conditioning is something that you might be interested in. And like the first internship I ever did was at one of those like private sector facilities where they train like combine guys. Um, and obviously that was super cool to experience um, to see that high level of athletes. But some of those guys are like I wouldn't argue that they don't need to be trained, but they also don't like to be trained because their ego says that I'm already this good. So why do I need this? Um, and so I had a little, I was a little conflicted there because in my mind, that was the only type of athlete that I could work with was people who, who were already capable. But nonetheless, I still enjoyed it and I knew I didn't want to do PT. So coaching seems like a good option. And then kind of got more into that, realized a lot of the, um, positions I was looking at did require a master's in your CSCS. Um, so I sat for my CSCS, went on to get my master's, and that's kind of where I got involved into working with the tactical population in the military. Mm. Advisor in my master's program did a lot of his research with police, military, and fire. And I kind of told him, like, I'm a guinea pig. Like, I don't really quite know where I want to go with this, but I know this is the career that I want to do. And he was like, perfect, I'm going to set you up with um, an internship. And I was working with 10th Special Forces Group at Fort Carson in Colorado, um, which was an awesome first exposure to that population. The guys that I got to work with were incredible. Um, and to kind of hear the stories and the backgrounds that they came from. Um, and so I kind of knew, like I said, working with these athletes who were already capable wasn't quite as motivating for me. Then to come work with these guys who are just physical grunts, like some of them, you wonder how they made it that far <laughs> with mm -hmm. their physicality. Like it, they just were able to grunt through all of their training. You see that. Um, but even for me as a coach, I'm so big on just building relationships with people. Um, and so whether that's, yes, getting bigger, faster, stronger, maybe is always the end goal, but they're not ever going to get to that point if I can't establish some sort of relationship with them. And so in that population, it was really cool because I would get to hear them tell stories about being deployed or being downrange. And like the number of times someone would say, hey, I've never shared this story with anybody before, but you just created this space for me to get this off my chest. And to me, that's way better than getting someone who's bigger, faster, stronger. Um, and so that went really far. And I knew like, man, this is the population that I really want to work with. Um, and it kind of my dad was a DEA agent, um, passed when I was younger. And so that kind of really brought me to that population as well. Um, not only was I doing it because I felt like I was helping these this population, um, but also I wanted to tie like familial ties to them. So that was kind of where the background and all of that led to. You know. No, that's awesome. That that's really cool. And so you got a minors in psychology along the way, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, funny story. Funny to say, I wanted to, um, and then. I think I, I, I minored in community, or I was one class away from minoring in communications, which mm -hmm. like was similar to psychology. Um, I just, I think I've always been drawn to communicating with people. Um, if you, if anyone knows me, I've always been kind of outgoing. Like as a little kid, I would talk to anyone and my mom's like, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> right. But <laughs> I talk to literally anyone that I run into. Um, and so, yeah, I think just, like I said, communications and relationships has always been, has always been so big for me. It did, um, actually, I'm working on my PhD now, and I considered doing a PhD in some sort of psych field. Um, but there's so, I hate to say this, I feel like so little you can do with that besides being a therapist. 
Um, and if I can just like, it just comes down to having a conversation, right. And, and just being able to open yourself up to anyone that you talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, and that in and of itself goes so far. So I didn't, no offense to anyone with a psych degree, but I didn't think like I needed a psych degree for that. Um, but it's definitely maybe a, an option. And, and I'm real big, like the kind of books that I read are like more psych based books. Um, so in a roundabout way, I kind of get that education, I guess. No, yeah, for sure. You know, honestly, there's a lot of things that, and, and I would agree with with that. I mean, you, you basically just go ahead and start a podcast, like the Whitney right. Campbell podcast. <laughs> it's so tempting, honestly. I yeah. just like talking to people. <laughs> it, exactly. And that's why I started podcasting rather than YouTubing, for example, because mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy having conversations. And, and it, I almost kind of cringe when people are like, oh, I really like this interview. I'm like, Ugh. like, I don't interview people because they're mm -hmm. not interviewing for a job. And I don't have... I don't, I mean, there's nothing here except for my energy drink and my water. Like that's really yes. all I've got, right? All, <laughs> all the stuff, right? Exactly. I don't Pumped have like a notebook. Talk. Exactly. I don't have a notebook to sit here and like go through questions and stuff. And so um, I agree with you. There's so many, you kind of get narrowed into a certain, um, I guess, career path when you do certain degrees, which there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. If you want to be a therapist, that's cool. Um, but like, I'm, honestly a little frustrated because I just finished up my MBA this last year mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, like half of these classes, I either already knew or I know people mm -hmm. that could have taught it to me for free. Absolutely. And I just spent how much on this degree that like, and most people don't even know I've got an MBA because it was for me and I wanted Absolutely. to gain the knowledge and, and the knowledge that I gained, honestly, some of it, I'm like, I'll never use because I'm not going into that kind of corporate structure of wanting mm. to be a CEO of an, an established sure. company and CEO also of red beard outdoors. <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. I, I went into it wanting to learn more for my own, like entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, red beard enterprises stuff. Right. Absolutely. So, yep. but I feel like I could have learned a lot of that just from people that I've, I've known because I've used that, like what you're saying, the communication piece of being okay to talk to people. Um, I mean, just the way that I approach you is the way I approach anyone, whether you've got a title or not. Um, Absolutely. I just like to talk to people and get to know who they are. And I, in uh -huh. turn, I've been able to, I've put my foot in my mouth a couple times. I'm be honest with you because I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm Jonathan, blah, blah. And I'll, I'll meet someone and, and, uh, and maybe I've even been working with the company a little bit and it turns mm -hmm. out to be like their CEO. And I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> like <laughs> I Yikes. probably should have known that. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah, um, it's similar in like um the military setting. Like mm. they want to be if you're working with active duty, they want to be addressed by rank, and you have like a colonel walk in. And to me, I'm just like, hey man, how's it going? It's a colonel <laughs> over there. <You're> like, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should have paid attention to that first. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, I hear that. But going back to, you know, that communication piece, that that's awesome that you create uh, an environment for people to be able to, to work out get a good training session in and train for what they're trying to do. But also, you know, you get kind of vulnerable when you're training. I mean, there's a lot of emotions Absolutely. that come out when you hit a hard training session. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not. And, um, it's cool that you provide that opportunity for people. So, so yeah, maybe there, there you go. There's your neck, your business idea is to go beat the crap out of people in the gym and then throw a microphone in front of them. Yeah. And, and just have them talk, talk to them. me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You might be onto something. That's there not a bad go. idea. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, I love that, that story and, you know, sorry to hear about your, your dad passing. Um, you know, the, the DEA lifestyle is definitely not, not easy. I imagine. Um, you know, my dad was a cop and so I can understand that mm -hmm. long hours, um, not necessarily the best job quality, <clears throat> but you know, it is what it is. So, yeah. And I'm um, so open to like talking about that. That's ultimately like what's led me to do everything in my life. Right. Like despite him, maybe not being here physically, I'm still so strongly motivated by him. Um, and so with everything that I've done in the hunting and outdoors and, and my career, like still a strong motivational factor in my life. And so it happens, but it's, it's still yeah. cool that like, I'm able to see it in that way. Right. Yep. No, exactly. So you're in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. have you always been in Texas or did you transplant there from somewhere else? Yep. So I grew up um, in the Dallas area, about 30, 45 minutes east of Dallas. Um, I've, it's so funny. You meet people from Texas and they're like, 
yeah, Tim says I never want to leave. Like, yeah. And <laughs> that's never been me. Like, I think yeah. I was first exposed kind of like outdoor space as a Girl Scout when I was younger. And like camping was kind of as good as it got. And I loved that. Um, but I was like, okay, what can I do beyond this? Um, and so I was, as, as I got older, I was like, as soon as I go to college, I'm leaving Texas. <laughs> I don't want to be here any longer because there's just so little to do here. And in my mind at the time, that was, that was my thoughts, especially in like the North Texas area. Mm-hmm. Um, stayed in Texas for my undergraduate degree and then left to go to Colorado for a couple of years for my master's. I love Colorado. I had been multiple times growing up as a kid and so I was there through, for my master's, through like mid-2020, peak COVID, and I just finished my master's looking for jobs, and everything was closed. And so I could have gotten a job at the local grocery store or something like that if I wanted to stay badly enough, but I was like, I just have a, I have a master's degree now. I want to do something that I, I've been working towards. Um, so I came back to Texas because Texas didn't care about COVID. It didn't exist here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and got an opportunity here in San Antonio. And when I first moved back to San Antonio, I was actually working on a lot of masters. And then just recently in the last year, I've left there and started working, which I won't be in Texas much longer. I'm going back to Colorado soon. Sweet. No, that's awesome. Uh, you know, and Colorado is a, a great state um, if you get out of the city. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's very yeah. similar. Yeah, it's it's similar to, you know, here in, in Utah, there's a lot to do, which, um, I was, so I'm originally from North Carolina mm-hmm. and I was going to, uh, we were going to move back when we got married. I told my wife, I'm like, just letting you know, like before we tie the knot here, I'm going to end up back East. So if you're not comfortable with that, then, you know, we should have some more discussions before we get married. She was like, no, I understand that. And again, that was when I was on my path of physical therapy degree, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's a whole culture in North Carolina that is just, and just in the South in general, where it's a lot of not necessarily healthy eating. They're hard workers. Um, and a lot of my mm-hmm. family grew up either in the military or on, on farms. Um, mm-hmm. and so hardworking people, but they also, when they get home, because they've been beat up all day, they want to sit back, drink a beer, do whatever, eat some good food, which isn't necessarily good for you. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's kind of a lazy lifestyle outside of working. And so, um, I was like, had this grand plan of like, I'm going to go back and like, I'm going to be the CSC, a certified PT that's going to you know mm-hmm. change my community. And, uh, that didn't end up happening because, um, as I was on this path, you know, I ended up meeting someone here in the neighborhood that, uh, introduced me to the mountains and being from North Carolina, I was so tired of all this dry out here in Utah. And I hadn't really mm-hmm. been in the mountains cause they're so big and you're like, if you're new to them, it's kind of hard to conquer mm-hmm. them or yeah, even want to go into them. And so when we got up there, I was like, okay, I'm hooked. And so, um, you know, you're going to love, absolutely love Colorado. I'm sure whenever you get out there and, and it's yeah, such a great I, state too, for physicality for, uh, it's was the healthiest state in the, in the union. I think, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely stoked to get back out there. Like I being in grad school, I didn't get to take quite as advantage, um, as all of the outdoors, but then once COVID hit. I was out there, I think from the span, like when was it mid February when things started closing down mm-hmm. till the time I moved in July. Man, I mean, mm-hmm. It's like over a hundred miles and we were just getting oh, out in the mountains awesome. and, and doing everything. And I just, I, yeah, then yeah I, I don't, sure. I don't know how long I'll be there. I'm kind of moving into this like remote lifestyle and traveling lifestyle of like moving different places for short periods of time. I spent a couple months in Virginia back in like February and March. Mm. Um, so I'm just exploring everywhere right now. So whatever sounds fun is where I'm headed. <laughs> That's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, so you'll be, and then you're just going to be in your same role that you're doing currently just mm-hmm. yep. in a different yep. state. So I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can work from, from anywhere. Um, as long as I'm just getting done what I need to get done. Um, mm-hmm. so that's, that's huge. It's the first time I've ever really had that flexibility. Like as a coach, you're pretty stationary in one place. Um, and then I've also kind of always been in school while I was coaching. And so I kind of got to this point, like I'm in my late twenties and was like, I've, li- I've not lived my life. Like I've spent so much time. And, and for a long time, I did really pride myself in that. Like I've gotten pretty far in my career for a sh- in a short period of time because I've just worked my ass off and I, and I'm proud of that. 
but I've not really lived a life outside of that either. And I kind of reached a point where I was like, life sounds fun. I want to make it more fun. <laughs> I don't want to work it, work my life away and like never experience much. And so that's kind of right. No, that's awesome. That that's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some places in Colorado. I mean, I haven't been to too many places. I've been to Colorado Springs, which is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, that's where I was living. Okay, yeah. Then yeah, my my uncle was stationed at. I'm trying to remember what the base was up there, but he was, was Fort he Carson. Was stationed at, yeah, Fort Carson. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I went up and visited him a couple times, and so. Um, I was actually there during the, uh, there was a blizzard that happened I'm trying to think this was back in probably 2011 or 2012 mm-hmm. where, um, people were getting stuck like on his two roads over from him in the neighborhood, there's this really steep hill and they'd go up the hill, but there's a stop sign at the top. So they'd stop and then there's no traction. So they were sliding mm-hmm. back down the hill and it was like watching ping pong because they were hitting the cars all the way oh, down. No. Boom, 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 boom. And then someone else would go up in their big old, you know, I'm a man, man truck, mm-hmm. you know, and they'd go right. up and they'd get the top and all the way down. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my gosh, it was terrible. But, uh, anyway, it, yeah, you, you'll love Colorado. You're going to have fun. Yeah. Um, absolutely. and then, uh, what got you into archery? I mean, were you um, raised that way? Did you pick it up recently? Yep, yes. So my, I've only been shooting for a little over two years now. Um, mm. I, I mentioned my dad and my grandpa, they were both hunters. Um, they both passed when I was super young, but they were rifle hunters. So I kind of grew up with the lifestyle for at least my early childhood um the freezer was always stocked with the meat that they hunted and each year we they would bring more home and i was such a picky eater as a kid so i didn't know until i was maybe like eight or nine years old that i was eating deer meat Mm, mm -hmm. make venison tacos and i just if she said it was chicken i ate it that was the only thing that i would (laughs) eat so she or she'd say it tastes like chicken and i would eat it um so that like I kind of was familiar with that lifestyle and I knew kind of as I got older when I was thinking about like the lifestyle that I wanted to live um, more of like a primal one. Um, Mm -hmm. So being able to self-sustain, feed myself, whether that's growing my own food, hunting my own food or whatever. Um, So that was what drew me to hunting. Um, And then as far as archery goes, I I knew I wanted to pick up a bow, but I was just kind of scared to Um, honestly like, the thought of walking into an archery shop by myself, maybe even as a female who's never shot. Like, I don't know what to ask. I didn't even know there was a difference between a compound bow and a recurve mm-hmm. bow. And like all the, I had no idea. So I really put it off for quite a long time. Um, and then I was actually dating a guy when I first got into it who was a bow hunter. Um, so we had walked into a shop and flung a couple arrows with this like kid's recurve bow. <laughs> I want to get into this. Like I, you're never going to get me to set this down. And within the next, I think like two weeks, um, I had bought my own bow. Um, I kind of went all out. I did the whole like buy once, cry once thing mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of getting some people recommended, like getting a used bow. Like I, I've heard in other podcasts that you've talked about, you definitely don't have to go all out on the first one. Um, but I, I did. <laughs> I, don't know about it. I definitely, I am now on my second bow. I don't have the bow that I started with. Um, but yeah, I just kind of picked it up and never stopped. And I saw it also too. I spent a whole year getting good at archery before I ever decided to go hunting. I knew I didn't want to step out there and just injure an animal. And by no means I was not good at archery. <laughs> There's definitely a skill to be developed. And I wasn't shooting often enough when I first started and I wasn't getting out there. And so I was like, I really want to develop this skill first. So I spent a whole year, even a little over a year, developing the skill before I ever even was to be slinging arrows at an animal. Mm-hmm. And I think that was, for me, it settled really well with me. And I think that's important for like a lot of people to do, but I know it's not common. <laughs> people are like, oh, I want to go on my first hunt. They go buy their first bow and the next week they have never seen it. It, it became, in that year, it became something more than just, I want to go hunting with this. It's such a like, Cathartic is the word that comes to mind, um, but you have to be so focused on what you're doing. And if you're not, you're not. At least where you want to get it, you might hit the target. 
you're not hitting it where you want to. And I would spend like if I was anxious or upset or like any mood that wasn't, or, and I shoot when I'm in a good mood too, right? I don't have to be in a bad mood to shoot. But <laughs> if I just so when Whitney to, like, has a bow in her hands, watch out, guys. <laughs> watch <laughs> out. It might not be great. <laughs> um, no, but I just if I just needed to escape, I if I could go shoot my bow, whether that was shooting in the garage or that was shooting at ten yards, twenty yards, whatever, like that was an escape for me. Um, and I be, kind of, it kind of became a crutch at, a, at one point in my life. And I was like, I need to associate archery with things other than escaping. Um, but then, yeah, so kind of got over that. Um, and so, yeah, I've only been shooting for about two years now. Um, it's been the best thing that I've ever done. Um, I, I think I saw you post the other day and you're asking people like, how often do they shoot? And like, I don't have a yard that I can shoot in, but I do have a garage. So I spend 90% of the time shooting at maybe seven yards. That really allows me to focus on my shot process, which is the most important part to me anyways of archery. And I think that's so incredibly overlooked by most people. Yeah, no, I agree. And honestly, uh, that's pretty much how I do it as well as, you know, my daily reps are either right here in the office, just right here with mm -hmm. this, you know, uh, make sure you've got a good target. So it's not going through the drywall, but, yep, yep. Um, you know, in, in here or the garage. And that that's a great way because you don't have to focus necessarily on your aiming. Once you've got your sight dialed, unless you screw with your stuff as much as I do, um, you're good to go. And yeah, <laughs> don't tinker that much. Like, <laughs> But uh, once you've got it dialed in, as far as the pins go, stop worrying about that and start worrying more about your mm -hmm. technique. And that's, that's a big deal of whether it be blank bailing, um, whatever it may be, you can take your time and go at a shorter distance and just work on your follow through work on pulling through the shot, work on making sure your anchor's good, making sure, you know, your wrist is locked the right way. You're, you're not high shoulder, like you've got all the good technique down mm -hmm. and then everything else will fall into place. So it's definitely a good idea to just, even if you can just shoot in your garage, you don't have to go out and drop long bombs every day. It's probably not even good Absolutely. to do that, to be honest. With Absolutely. You. Um, because you're yeah. so much less consistent at longer distances. And, and I don't know about everybody, but for me, if I'm not, hitting the bullseye on the target and I'm beating myself up about it. Like, what did I do wrong? What do I need to change? Well, hey, she's check on her my second sight. bow. <laughs> yeah. She threw her first yes. one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, do I need to move my sight left? Do I need to move it right? And then I come mm -hmm. in at 20 and I'm like, oh, like this isn't so bad. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't recognize the value in that at first. It's not like I picked up the bow and was like, oh, the process is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, you just want to go sling and arrows. And once I was like, man, I can be more consistent when my draw is the most consistent and when I finally piece that together as well, like this game is the game for me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And are you a left-handed shooter? I oh, am, yeah, which is funny. I'm right-handed. Um, mm -hmm. but with most all other things, I'm left side dominant. Um, uh, but I, I'm left eye dominant. And so mm -hmm. that was why when I first picked up a bow, I was drawing back with my right side. Um, and I was just really having trouble looking through the peep. I can only, people laugh at me for this, but I can only even close my, my right eye. I can't even close my left eye. So I think the guy that was trying to help set me up was like, close your left eye. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I physically cannot close that eye. And so he was like, well, what I was like, I do know I am left eye dominant. And he said, mm. well, I'm going to put you in a left-handed row. And, and I was afraid to do that at first because I know I was so much stronger on my right side and just out of ego. <laughs> I was like, God, I don't want to have to shoot super lightweight because I'm shooting with my left side and I'm not like imbalanced or anything. So it ended up not really being much of a trade off. Right. Um, and I yeah. think I am now significantly straighter, significantly stronger on my left side. now. I'm so glad that I said that because had I never said that I would have been trying to shoot right handed all this time and trying to figure out like probably have an eye patch or something. Mm -hmm. I can't close my other eye. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I just grabbed this bow real quick because for mm -hmm. those of you guys that have little kids, this one's an ambidextrous. It says shoot, shoot oh, cool. through riser for kids. Um, okay. But, and it even has a little pin that you can put in it that will come down right here where my finger is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to put a pin, I don't let my kids have pins yet, but um, anyway, my daughter, uh, was, she was shooting. I got two little right-handed bows that are similar to that. And we were going to the little range and just had a little target at 10 yards and she was consistently way off. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And like, mm -hmm. and I would try and push the bow to get her on target. And she was like fighting me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> what are you doing? She's like, well, it looks like I'm off target when you're pushing me. And she's mm. only six. And so, mm -hmm. um, I had a, there was a, a trainer that happened to be in the range at the time. And she looked over, she was like, is your daughter left-handed? I said, no, she's, well, she's kind of ambidextrous, but really right-handed. Um, she was like, well, she's not, I mean, she's like leaning her head. She's left eye dominant. I was like, oh, so mm -hmm. as soon as I picked up this bow for her, she's like pegging the target. I was like, okay, well, that's cool. So that's definitely something that people need to keep an eye out for. And that's why I brought it up yeah. is because I wanted to kind of hear your, uh, your aspect of it. Cause there's a couple of, I'm going to say mainly women, um, mm -hmm. that are left eye dominant and are right-handed mm -hmm. in everything else. Um, for those that may know Jess, follow her arrow. Um, she mm -hmm. shot right-handed for the longest time. And I mean, she took years before she finally swapped to left-handed bow and uh, it's because she's left eye dominant. She felt better after you get the, you know, the draw cycle and everything down. For sure. Um, yeah. And so it, it's interesting to me, and I don't know what the statistics are, if this, if it's more predominant in women than men, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if there's just less women shooters. So it seems like a bigger number. I don't know, but it seems like to me, the, the women that I've spoken with, a lot of women are left eye dominant, right handed. And so anyway, that's, that's key for people that are going out there, whether you're getting your kids into it or you're new to it yourself. Um, there's a simple little test that you can do. And I don't, did he have you do the little eye dominant like test? triangle thing? Yeah. yeah. I knew okay. that because I like working with um, military and mm, just, like mm -hmm. when I first started working with 10th group, I'd get to go out on the range with them and they, I was terrible shooting at the time, <laughs> but we'd be shooting at steel targets and they like, I'm trying to look with my right eye. And there were actually a mm. couple guys that I was shooting with who were right-handed left eye dominant. And they were like, maybe try shooting with your left hand or at least make sure that's the main eye. That then we did the eye dominance test when I was there. And I, so that was kind of how I knew. So I, I knew to reference that when I got in, because even shooting with handguns or anything like that, I kind of always struggled. I grew up, I wouldn't say I shot handguns regularly, uh, mm -hmm. but I would go like relatively probably more often than, than most people do. And I knew that I always struggled with just trying to see straight, but I didn't know why until I figured out, Oh, maybe because I'm trying to look at it through. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So I kind of want to go back through your process here. Cause you brought up something really good and it's not even just for women. It's for anyone that's new to archery. I know when I, when I first started, um, I'm kind of one of those people that's all in. Uh, and, and so mm -hmm. I knew when I was going to pick up archery, like, I didn't want to walk into the shop and look dumb. I'll just say it frankly. That's what it was. Most people I, don't. I didn't know the <laughs> yeah, I didn't know the terminology. I didn't know the people. Um and you know, a lot of outdoorsy type people or shooters, whether it be rifle, I'm sure there's a lot more uh machoism that goes into rifle shooting. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, with with archers, like you know, you go in and there's some people that just you can tell they know their stuff and you don't want to look dumb in front of them. First off, I know this is easier said than done. It doesn't matter if you look dumb, right? Go in and ask some good questions though. Absolutely. And, and you don't have to know the terminology, but just go in and look actually and be open for feedback and, and let them know that you're not trying to put your ego into it. You just want to know. But yeah. what are some ways, I mean, you mentioned you had a boyfriend at the time that took you into the shop. So um, is that, a route that you would recommend to people is that someone that you know that you trust maybe that shoots archery mm -hmm. ask them to go with you um you know in retrospect i i guess i think early on i knew that i wanted to get into it and it was just the mm -hmm. fear of walking in right um i don't think that you necessarily oh and it depends i guess on the type of person right like mm -hmm. i am i love making a fool of myself almost and like I'm, I'm okay with looking <laughs> stupid i'm okay with asking dumb questions that's never bothered me um and so even like shortly thereafter when i was going to the bow shop by myself i still didn't really know i didn't know what a limb was i didn't know like there's different types of arrows are you what what do you mean there's different types of arrows there's different types of releases like i had no clue and so when people would talk to me about different things i would just stop and be like hey what is that? What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't necessarily think that you need someone to walk in with, but if, if you, it can make it more easy, more comfortable. Um, so I would kind of recommend like, if that is like, if archery is something that someone's looking to get into and you're just afraid to make that first step into a bow shop, 
um, if you have a friend or someone that you know who is familiar, at least maybe they're not great at it or they haven't been doing it for very long, um, they're at least familiar with it, that can help make it be a little bit more comfortable experience. But like I said, I like shortly thereafter was going by myself all the time and was like, please tell me. And still to this day, I will ask. Hey, what does that like? You said a word I'm not familiar with, or you referenced mm-hmm. something with my bow that I'm not familiar with. Can you tell me? Can you tell me what that means? And, and I've learned so much just by asking questions. And the guys that the guy who runs the bow shop that I go to like loves me for that. <laughs> He's like, you're just like this sponge that is willing to take in everything. And I say, if my bow shop is nowhere near me, but I try to get out there as often as I can. And I'm like, man, if you guys were around the corner for me, I would be here every single day unpaid because I just I want to learn. And I'm so curious. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you're what you're someone who goes all in. And I'm the same. If I'm going to be good at something, I'm going to be good at something. Just when you say put your whole ass into it, not your half ass. <laughs> so mm-hmm. exactly. I'm going to I'm going to put everything into it and be yeah. as good, at least put as much effort into it. That doesn't mean I'm going to be the best archer by any means, but I know that I'm going to put my best efforts into it. And so that means for me learning and asking as many questions as I can. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a good point. And I do want, you know, you brought up a good point that you went all in and bought, you know, flagship bow, all the good accessories and stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, I, yeah. I did mention on a previous podcast that like, don't feel like you have to do that, but if mm-hmm. it's within your budget and you yeah. can do that, definitely do that. Um, but also understand that spending that money is not going to get you to be a better shooter. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you can still screw up and do wrong when you have the nicest, best equipment. It's funny because I, I see people come into the bow shop all the time that have been shooting for years and they just keep buying the newest, brightest, shiniest stuff thinking it's going to make them better, but they hardly ever shoot. And mm-hmm. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. it'd be better that you go get that $30 release and, you know, anchor correctly every single time and get <laughs> yeah. that down than it is to buy the Absolutely. newest $300 release and think that's going to fix your problems. Um, Absolutely. you know, and so that, that's a big thing for people as well. It's just like with any other sport or activity, you know, uh, everything from pickleball, getting the nicest, I don't know, paddle, <laughs> I think is what it's called. Yeah. Um, getting I'm the nicest really, paddle all the way to, Right. <laughs> I love pickleball. Um, but uh, I used to think it was a retirement sport and now I've kind of eaten my words on that one. But, um, you know, from from that, getting the nicest paddle that, man, they have some paddles out there for a couple hundred bucks, which to me, I'm like, I wow. think better swing for me and score for me every time if I'm Absolutely. spending that kind of money. <laughs> uh, and then you've got the rifles out there that are thousands and thousands of dollars without even any optics or ammo to go with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can spend that money. And you're still not going to be able to hit out to a hundred yards unless you know what you're doing. Uh, same with archery. You can get the nicest, coolest, shiniest, whatever piece of equipment and all the nicest things that everyone talks about on YouTube and Instagram and all the other cool places. Um, it's not going to make you shoot any better, you know? And Absolutely. so, so that that's a big part of it as well. Um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that you're, it's probably good that your bow shop's a little further away from you because Mine's only 10 minutes north. I mean, I'm there multiple times a week. I'm like the, uh, they, they've tried to get me on the payroll a couple of times. I'm like, I'm not, cause <laughs> then I'll never get to shoot my bow, but I'm going to exactly. be up here to help you guys out. <laughs> and then by helping out, I'm, I'm learning, you know, because I exactly. see them messing with bows and mm-hmm. I'm learning to tie D loops and all this stuff. Um, and I'm good at customer service so they can go back and do all the technical stuff. And I can go talk to people about all the gear stuff that I know. So you know, that's kind of that I'm kind of in that same boat where I'm like, I'm always asking questions and they kind of laugh because, uh, Marcus is the guy that who's my bow tech and we've Mm -hmm. become friends. At least I think we're friends. I think he thinks that too, but (laughs) (laughs) fingers crossed we're on the same page. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that's how it is. Um, but we just laugh. I'm like, yeah, back in 2019, he sold me a bow and he can't get rid of me. Like (laughs) that's pretty much what it is. So, uh, it's cool to, to be that sponge. And I want going back to the new archers out there and and I mean, new archers in general, but also for, for women out there, don't feel, don't feel dumb. Like there is no dumb question unless you go in and you ask them what they sell at a bow shop. That might be a little crossing a line, but you know, going into a bow shop and, and asking genuine questions and learning how to, you know, the different terms and all the different things. And if they say something that you don't understand, just be like, Hey, 
let, obviously let them finish the sentence, but be like, Hey, just like you said, I didn't understand what that was that you referenced. Would you mind mm -hmm. pointing that out? And then you've gained yeah. some knowledge, right? So Absolutely. I think that's a great way of approaching it. And I, I appreciate you saying that. Is there anything else that you've learned kind of along the way, um, uh, through your archery experience, even though it's only been a couple of years, there's still a lot of time when you're actually practicing and, and going to the shop and getting better. What else have you learned that you would say to a new archer, a new, a new shooter? Hmm. That's such a broad question. <laughs> Well, um, let me, let me narrow it down a little bit, I guess with okay. training, how did you, you said your, your left side's gotten significantly better mm -hmm. and stronger. That might be a hurdle that some people that are right-handed might have to overcome and mm -hmm. it's kind of overlooked Absolutely. maybe because again, you're used to training, you're, you're a CSCS, you, you know how to build up muscle mm -hmm. function properly, get the right technique down. Um, but for people that maybe needed to transition or even are just new to drawing a bow and they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, I can pull 70 pounds and they go to pull it back. They're like, Oh crap. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. what, what would you recommend as far as building up, um, I guess, building that up, building up your strength? Yeah. yeah. I think, and this goes with anything that you're getting into for the first time. Um, but specifically into like strength type things, like just go into it and don't have an ego right like i i'm very i can be bad about that um uh, like i used to compete in powerlifting and i'm like nowhere near as strong as i used to be but even sometimes i'll catch myself doing what i call ego lifting and mm -hmm. i'm like man i'm not even that strong anymore but i still want to throw that weight on the bar to like show myself and others that i can still do that and then inevitably it never ends well <laughs> uh, but same thing with this right like just go in there and don't have an ego and don't be afraid to ask the questions and like I'm fortunate because I have enough strength, like a funny story. When I was walking into our tree shops for the first time, they see me as this like relatively smaller female. Um, so they're like, Oh, we have this woman's bow and this woman's bow and you can draw back like 30, 40 pounds with this. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Like that's, you right. can still get animals with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I like went to draw back and was like, well, that was easy. So they upped it some more and I'm like, well, that was easy. <laughs> and I was like, I just, I, I wanted to try a couple out and I straight up had to say, Hey, like I'm probably a lot stronger than I might look. Um, like I'm open to trying some quote unquote men's bows. Um, I don't think, I don't like the idea of calling it like men's and women's bows. Like anybody can shoot whatever. Yeah. Um, but I was like, here's relatively where I think that I am. So I started out shooting. I think the first bow I got was at like 50 or 51 um and then i've slowly worked my i have 60 pound limbs now and i'm at 57. um mm -hmm. i have no desire to go beyond 60 but i have i've instead of been shooting almost two years and i've worked my way up like five or six pounds um so don't go in there expecting to draw back a lot like work work your way up um most of the to bow techs they know what they're talking about so trust them um i've always just leaned like i knew nothing so it just made sense to lean into whatever it is that they had to say um and just yeah be enjoy the process of it right like not even just the physical shot process but the yeah. process of learning and adapting a skill and getting good at a skill um it you're not going to be good at it at first you're not going to be strong at first it's going to feel weird at first because you've never done it before you're not going to hit the bullseye at first all the time it's just and, and inevitably that's how it is when you're new at things and mm -hmm. i think a lot of people want to pick something up and be good at it the first time which i i can be a victim of that <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but i think i recognized in archery that like that just wasn't realistic um mm -hmm. and, and so just yeah going in like don't have an ego be vulnerable ask questions trust that now there might be some shops where the botex aren't as great um but just trust that they at least know a little bit more than you um, because like I said, you're going in there knowing nothing as a new archer and, and just listen to what they have to say, take it all in. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, you, you brought up a good point there. Uh, it, it is, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, like there, there are the different classifications of the men's and women's bows. Right. And, and it's mainly got to do with draw length and poundage. Mm -hmm. But if you're to the point where you can shoot those flagship bows that do go up to the higher poundages, you know, I, I agree that bow techs need to be open to that as well. Um, but they probably deal with women coming in all the time that maybe don't even train weights at all, let alone, Absolutely. and you could train weights all the time. 
it's different when you can get the biggest, bulkiest dude in there that can bench press three, 400 pounds mm-hmm. and he can't pull back 60 pounds. I've Why is it, that? Yeah. Well, because their shoulders, the internal mechanism of the shoulder is mm-hmm. not as strong as it should be. They're not used to using the, the rear muscles that they need to use uh, to be able to pull back a bow. It's kind of an awkward. But chest day. See people, yeah. Yeah. But chest <laughs> day. That's all that matters. You know, yeah. I can't see my back in the mirror. Why yeah. do I care about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just, it, it's one of those things that it's a big deal. Like um, I, I've noticed a huge improvement for me, even people that have been shooting bows for years, I can pull back. I could probably, I mean, I've, I've pulled up to 85 pounds and they don't make anything bigger than that. And for me, it was like, it would come back really easy. And then I've been handing it to people that have been shooting 70 pounds for years and they can't, they don't want to screw up their shoulders. What they tell me, nothing wrong with that, but you got to change your training a little bit. Cause I used to have some popping and clicking and stuff like that in my shoulders. And just by simply doing the little 10 pounds, 20 pounds bands and doing the proper movement with that and getting that mobility in there, no more clicking, no more popping. And I can go shoot an 80 pound bow all day at tack all weekend. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sore. I don't even have any issues, you know? So it has nothing to do with all the weight that you can push around. Even if you're not a big weight trainer, go in and do the proper things to take care of your shoulders. Because again, you being a CSCS, you know what it takes to have healthy shoulders, which is one of the weakest joints, if not the weakest joint in the body Absolutely. and being able to take care of your shoulders so that you can pull back heavier poundage so that you can, you have the option. Now, do you want to pull mm-hmm. lighter weight? Do you want to pull heavier weight? Do you want to shoot a heavier arrow? Do you want to shoot a lighter arrow? Now the, the control is in your hands because yeah. you have trained your body to the point where now you get that option. You're not limited yeah. by your fitness. And that's something that Dan Staten talks about a lot, Mm -hmm. limitless fitness rather than limited fitness. And that can go from cardio to your shoulders being healthy to whatever it may be, strength, being able to carry out a heavy pack, being Mm -hmm. able to take one trip instead of three, that kind of thing. Um, All of those things go into the fitness aspect. And so just to kind of end on the, the fitness aspect here, do you feel like for you, not even... Mm -hmm. I'm going to say as a woman, do mm-hmm. you feel like as a woman training has allowed you to be more confident in even just asking those questions in a bow shop or anywhere else? Do you feel more confident because mm-hmm. you know you're capable in the gym and around all these other guys that you're training around you probably kick some of their asses? Uh, what I mean, is that something that is a is an actual thing? Do you feel more confident because you're trained? Yeah, absolutely. I love that you asked that question. Um, yes, to like short answer. Yes, absolutely. Um, I one thing that I just really pride myself in is like being confident in who I am as a person. And I think a lot of that comes from because I I know not I think I know that I'm capable of a lot of things, whether that's like communicating or talking and having a conversation or I'm capable of picking up heavy things. I'm capable of doing things that most women, but even men can't do. And I laugh, I'm like selling some stuff in my apartment and I sold a washer and dryer yesterday and this guy came in and he's like my size, maybe even a little bit smaller. <laughs> and I was like, I can get that for you if you need. And he kind of looked at me and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not trying to like emasculate yeah. you or anything, yeah. but like, I can help you. And he kind of mm-hmm. looked at me like, Oh, you can help me. And I'm like, yeah. all right, you know what? This is your thing. I'm not yeah. going to do anything. I throw your back but out I, with your ego. Yeah. Absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Go for it, dude. I'm, I'll, I'm here to watch it. Um, but I think like, I have no problem. Like I said, approaching people, I'm way more confident in myself because I'm confident in my capabilities. And I think that plays into so many aspects of life. Even if I'm like, I've always worked out kind of in a weight room with coworkers. Um, but so now that I'm not like working in a weight room anymore for the first time in my life, I'm training at like recreational gyms and I'm going in and like, I don't think because I've worked out mostly with males, I don't think that mm-hmm. I'm that strong. <laughs> and then I go into like a recreational gym and people are like, you're just, like t- today someone was like do you train in the crossfit games you're so strong like literally just this morning and i was running intervals on the treadmill i wasn't even lifting yeah. 
And he was yeah. like, you're like, you look so strong. Are you in the CrossFit games? And I was like, thank you. But absolutely. Like, those are freak athletes. I am very mm. near those capabilities. But yeah, I think just being fit, like, and fit looks different for everybody. Right. Like, I think one thing that I preach is at least get steps in. If you're going out every single day and you're getting 10, 12,000 steps in a day, that doesn't mean you have to be throwing. Athletes. If you're doing yoga, you're running, if you're rocking, if you're lifting, like whatever fitness looks like to you, Pilates, like whatever mm-hmm. fitness looks like to you, it's going to make you feel just more confident in yourself and more capable. Um, and that has played into all aspects of it. 100%. No, I agree with that. And uh, man, I could, I could keep going forever conversation (laughs) we're gonna have to do a part two at least if not more than that um oh for sure but i i want to end there because i i know that a lot of people can gather and hopefully they have gathered some good information here because you're you're brand new to archery i i still Mm -hmm. say i'm new um and you're you've been shooting for a couple years but you're still learning you're a sponge and and that's something that is really key for people but also and i i want to highlight that aspect of the the fitness aspect. You don't have to go and try and look like you're training for the CrossFit games, but it will raise your confidence level. And I don't, I don't care what people say that they're happy with their bodies. Um, that's fine if you really feel that way, but I, I highly doubt that people that are overweight or not able to go play with their kids or not able to go hike are truly happy. Uh, I would argue with anyone that says that. I don't care what really things are being pushed nowadays and what they're trying to say about accept yourself for who you are. That's cool. I'm on board with that, but I really don't think you're genuinely happy. And and so when when you have been trained and you are training and you're confident, know you can accomplish things, that's that rolls over into so many different aspects and allows you to be more confident when it comes to asking questions. And even if you are a minority in wherever you go, whatever it is, if you're trying to pick up something new, again, I'm going to bring up pickleball because I, you know, been playing that lately because my boss was into it. And I was like, yeah, that's a retirement sport, you know, picking on for being old. I picked and up then disc I got golf, into so it. I can't say anything. <laughs> that's yeah, a retirement I guess you're right. sport. <laughs> uh, man, I can, I can just picture you with like your little caddy and your... <laughs> I haven't gone that far yet. I just have like the basic setup. But, You're like, like it hasn't arrived have... yet. It's showing up in my Colorado house. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know, everything, any, any kind of new area, if you go in and you're confident, you're okay asking questions, you know, training and, and your level of fitness, you don't have to, again, look like a CrossFit athlete, but training in and of itself in any sort of fashion, whether it be biking, uh, weightlifting, CrossFit, whatever it may be. If you train and you're comfortable in your own skin, you're going to be more comfortable asking questions and that's going to not limit you when it comes to getting in the outdoors, even just getting the right hiking equipment, backpacking equipment, being confident out there and not thinking that you're going to fall off a cliff or get injured and not be able to come back or or sprain your ankle, whatever. It's Mm -hmm. not going to limit like what you were saying, living life the way you want to live your life. You're not going to be stuck in a cubicle and on your couch for the rest of your life. You'll be able to go out and enjoy some fun things. So yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah. So let, let's just end it there. We'll definitely have to just schedule a part two. Um, I don't know, sometime soon and, yeah. uh, and get you back Please. on here, but where, where can people find you, especially mm-hmm. people that are interested in some kind of training, maybe even how you got into bows a little bit more, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, where can they find you at Whitney? Yeah, I am on Instagram at my Instagram is at Whitney Trammell, T-R-A-M-E-L. I think maybe there's two underscores at the end of it. I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> um, but feel free. Yeah, follow me, reach out to me, um, ask me any questions that you may have. I'm always open. To, I love answering questions. And if I don't have an answer, I'm certainly going to try my hardest to find one. Like I said, I don't know everything. I'm still relatively new. But yeah, feel free to follow me and reach out to me. And I I love meeting new people. So if you strike up a conversation, I'll probably talk back to you. (laughs) Sweet. And then uh, do you train, do you personally train people or is it more of, go ahead. Um, I haven't recently. Um, I've thought more and more about kind of starting my own business and doing that kind of stuff. Um, 
geared towards like more the outdoor stuff, preparing mm-hmm. for the outdoors. But I then that's I realized recently that's becoming something that's really big. So but not that like there's competition with everything. So I've considered it now that I've kind of left coaching and as much as more of just being a coach. I think I mostly just miss like the human aspect of it. So I've considered it. Um, so if some, if somebody needs something, I'm definitely always open to helping them with that as well. All right. Well, we just came up with two business ideas while you're on the podcast. So uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to come to you for all my help. Right. <laughs> you got an MBA, right? That's what it's for. Yeah, exactly. I'm good at ideas. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, guys, I'll leave all the links down below so you can find Whitney, go ask her questions. Um, she'll be a great resource for you, especially as she's also continuing her journey in archery moving out west she's going to get into elk hunting she's going to be an elk slayer yeah (laughs) Yeah, exactly uh but yeah i'll leave all the links down below guys and thanks again for tuning in and like i always say get out live your life and love it